Okay, we're live, and uh, I seem to have grown an extra pair of arms on this stream. Not sure what is causing those extra arms. <laughs> that, was, that was a guest appearance from illustrator, extraordinarily talented wife of mine, uh, my S. Kemble, which you guys should check out. So I'm going to do a really quick live stream. Um, I am working on uh, a book called Not Death, But Love. And it's a story about Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning. And basically, um, I'm doing a day stream. So obviously, there's going to be a lot of activity going on around me. And I'm planning on doing this for about an hour uh, because... Um, uh, Gary Hodges has a stream coming up at 11 that I plan on attending. And I think uh, if you guys are into my streams and stuff like that, uh, you should show up for his live stream too. I might even appear on it. I don't know. We'll see. But I want to watch Gary's uh, live stream at 11. So I'm going to basically walk through the process of coloring a page real quick um, in this style, which brings its own challenges to it. So... Uh, I usually do art that's like um, black and white and it's it's inked um, uh, like traditionally. And then I'll take the inks into Photoshop. There's a specific way that I do like the setup where you've got like solid black, solid white, and you're working in bitmap. Um, like not really bitmap, but you're kind of like bitmapping the line. Like you're making the line <clears throat> to where it's aliased so that it's making like a step ladder. And then you can use that to make selections and do color from it. Um, so that coloring process, uh, I think I've done tutorials before on my channel to kind of show that. But we're going to get into a different coloring process, which is more like what do you do when you're doing pages like the one that I'm working on, um, where you have like a lot of pencil art. It's, it's like almost like a pencil rendering. And then you're wanting to overlay that over color without using... Uh, the overlay option and when you're doing that how do you control your black like meaning um, when you're doing like grayscale and this will make more sense once I pull up the page but once you have grayscale tones on your color uh, you have a whole variety of black and how do you basically control for the printer like let's say I want a, a rich black my favorite rich black um, which is going to be 50 50, 50, 100 in the CMYK scale because everything offset is printed in CMYK um, unless you're working with like a web press or something like that. But I'm doing this art for offset. So I want to make sure I have really good control over the, the color of my black line so that when it's over uh, the solid flats uh, that I'm using, uh, it's I've got control over what that tone is. So um, that's interesting because as I'm working on this uh, pencil rendering and this kind of like more rendered look, um, I'm using also white to kind of pull into the gray tones and then I'm using black to kind of go over that. So what it, what you end up with, let's go ahead and pull open the page um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into it. But just so you know, uh, what is this live stream? This is a live stream where I just kind of work on this crazy graphic novel. Um, and usually other crazy graphic novels. This one in particular, I need to do 232 pages in 365 days. And so um, I luckily am doing it in a style that's relatively faster than my other style. Um, but let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get into this. Because um, like I said, this is going to be a relatively short stream. I know people are used to my five hour uh, live streams. And I will say I'll be live streaming all day. So basically I'm gonna finish, I'm gonna do this live stream, uh, whether, whether I'm done or not, like around 10.30, right now it's 9.30 my time. Around 10.30, I'm gonna take off. And then if you guys are watching, I encourage you guys to go with me to watch Gary Hodges' uh, live stream. Um, and, uh, that should be fun while he's working on dinosaurs versus Mars bots around 11. I think he's going to go for about two hours and I'm going to be streaming throughout the day on my channel after that as well. I just don't want to compete with, uh, with what he's got going at 11. 
so yeah, so that's that's basically where we're at. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull open the page and we'll get into this. So let's let's go ahead and go back to our daily stream. And this is my finished uh, pencil page. Um, I need to move a few windows around. Okay, so hopefully this will kind of make sense as to where this is problematic. Um, uh, like for instance, if I had just worked in black with the eraser tool, this would be relatively easy because then I just consolidate consolidate all my black line work um, to one layer. But where this is going to become problematic are areas where, um, let's see if I can find an area like that. Did I already take out those areas? No. Well, where it's going to become problematic are areas like this. Like, um, let me, you know what, we'll make it better. Let's, let me go ahead and make the background uh, black so you can see what I'm talking about for like concern areas when I'm trying to control my black to be like one color. You see all that white? Uh, I want to delete that. I want to get, get all of the white out of my line area um, because that's all white that I painted in, which again works really well. But the problem is if I like lock my transparent layers and then I fill over that, um, that's going to be a real problem when it comes to uh, when it comes to this this stuff. Uh, let me also pull in. I'm going to put this into the window. I have my layers out, so I want to put that into the window so you guys can see a little more of what I'm talking about. So yeah, so um, hopefully you guys can see where that would be a problem. I'm sure it's a problem that a lot of people have experienced, and it's a really easy fix. So let's go ahead and. Uh, and get into it are easy fix. So again, this wouldn't apply if you're working traditionally with just solid blacks and solid whites um, for your line art layer. This is not going to be very helpful. Um, this is a specific coloring technique that works if you're working with like a full palette of gray tones and stuff like that. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to take my image and I'm going to convert it to grayscale. And it looks like Jake is watching, which is cool. So once I say uh, convert to grayscale, it's going to say, do you want to flatten uh, the layers? And, and I'm going to say, yes, I want to flatten it. So I'm flattening all my layers. Oh, my goodness. Discard co color information. I'm going to say, OK. And so now you'll see all the layers on the, on the right uh, have converted to, to just a solid background, right? Um, now... If I did this right, I'm going to go to image mode and it's going to say it's grayscale, which is really good. Now I'm going to go to my channels and I think I'm going to just hit, I think it's command or option. I can't remember. Yeah, it's command. Okay. So I'm going to go to my channels now and I'm going to hit command and hit my layer. And that's going to select everything that's clear on the layer. I'm going to select the inverse. I'm going to go back to my layers, right? I'm going to make a new layer. And then I'm going to basically, right now, I'll just use the default black. I'm going to just hit um, Command Fill, which is Shift F5. And it's going to show me my foreground color. Now, this is going to look really strange because what I'm doing is, like, if you look at my layer here, this is my background layer. Now, I've basically um, made a selection of all the black without the white. And uh, now we don't have that problem. So that problem that I showed you at the beginning where we have all that white uh, in the layers, now we've gotten rid of that. So let me select all. I'm going to put, I'm just going to fill the background with black. And, and if I've done this effectively, it's just going to look like a solid black layer. You're not going to see all that white gray tone that you saw before. And check it out. We did it. We did it effectively. So... That's amazing. Okay, I'm excited about that. So now I'm going to call this background. I have my white layer. I'm going to take my old background layer and I'm going to delete it out. And then we're going to go back to image mode and we're going to transfer this back to CMYK because we're making this for offset printing. And it's going to say, do you want to uh, merge? And I'm going to say, don't merge. Okay. So I know a lot of people would at like like doing just like a multiply effect on their uh, on their things and then doing color underneath. 
and that's one way to do it. But I like this because now I'm going to go to my color. Uh, let me find my color settings here. And I'm going to go to my color sliders, and I'm going to pick my favorite rich black. And I'm, I'm a CMYK nerd, and a CMYK nerd is somebody who's going to... Uh, let's see if we can get into color here. Can you guys see that on screen now? A CMYK nerd is going to basically actually get into percentages of cyan, magenta, yellow. I'm having at 50%. And then I'm going to have my black at 100%. Um, this this creates like a black that looks like darker and more accurate. Um, and and this is the exact rich black that I used on Jacob's apartment. And I will tell you, like when you print in color, um, it's going to make a difference if you're using a rich black. You don't have to use 50, 50, 50, 100. It's just um, that's my favorite. That is my absolute favorite rich black. So now I've, I've got that selected. I've got my 50, 50, 50, 100. And I'm going to basically select all. I'm going to make sure I have my transparent pixels, which is like you'll notice under your layers, you're going to see a thing that says lock. And the first thing shows a little pixel icon. You're going to click that and make sure that you have your, your now your separated black area is the transparent pixels are locked. I'm going to hit Shift F5 to fill the foreground. And now I have all of my line art is a gray version, a grayed out version of my favorite rich black, which is, uh, to me, just the coolest thing in the world. So I'm going to turn off my... Um, my guides, I don't need to see those while I'm coloring. Um, I have nothing going. Uh, well, I might need to see those once it gets to that bottom panel, um, which I'm probably going to have to burst out the edges of. Um, but I think I think this this at least gives you a rough idea of how I would like set up my blacks for this. And now at this point, I'm going to save this file as um, my other file I called as pencils. So it's uh, this is page three we're working on. Why is this uh, not working now? Hold on a second. I'm going to say save onto your computer and we're going to save it as, well, my, my memory is, is having trouble here on my computer. I'm going to save it as uh, inks. Or I'm just going to actually save this as a final. And that way, like, obviously, if I have, uh, like, once I get this to my publisher, if there are further revisions or anything like that, um, then basically I can save it as, like, final one, final two, and so on. Okay, so now we're ready to get into color. I'm going to show you guys a little thing from my pitch. Um, so this is like a little sneak preview of other pages to come that are formatted to the old format that we pitched to. Uh, this book is 7 by 10 um, with like a 0.125 eighth of an inch bleed. And, uh, and then I think it's got a 0.25 uh, safe area, um, which is basically the area that like you don't want your text to go out of or it'll get cut off by the printer. And I, I like to ride my pages all the way to the safe area. I don't know if that's, that's not a common thing. A lot of people like to give a little more buffer with the edge of their page and the safe area. But for me, I like a page to be really flush and close to the edge if it can be, um, which I know printers may not be super fond of, but that's what I like to do. All right, so we're gonna, I'm gonna pull open my pitch now uh, and I'm gonna open one of my original pitch files. Now, why I'm doing this is um, there's a couple color tones that I've already established in this. So you're going to see, I basically did my pitch a little different. I multiplied the color over the line. Um, in this case, I don't think it really matters uh, what which route I'm going to go. But what I'm going to do is I want some color, common color threads throughout this. So I'm going to eye drop... Um, and I, this is Elizabeth Barrett Browning's brother, so I'm wondering if I should eye drop kind of the pale color that I'm going to be using for her. Um, 
I don't know if I like that. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of start with Robert's color palette which has 0 17 21 and 0. And then I think I'm going to use that as a base color to fill with. I also want to probably clean up my lines here. Um, again, I want to do 50 50 50 and 100. Okay, so here I'm going to clean up little gaps. Um, this is the downside of like, you know, if you're working in ink, it's a lot easier to kind of fill these little voids that you're going to see, especially on a traditional page. But I just want to make sure I don't have any other little slivers like that uh, on the edges. Ah, there's one. So we're just kind of filling some of those so that we don't have obvious moments where it's really clear. The, the the great thing about getting rid of little gaps like that is it it maintains the illusion of this not being digital. Um, the second you have little artifacts like that, um, it's it's like a dead tell to the to the mind that something's artifacting, something's not natural, something something is um, amiss with the process of the art. So I like to fill these little gaps. So that's something else I'm going to do just to kind of go through and do all that. And then we'll get into our lovely color in a second to just kind of just kind of trying to get rid of some of these gaps. And I'm literally doing these pages, um, you know, it, I'm not using some like crazy magic trick to do these pages. Um, I, I'm literally using the Kyle Webster uh, brush. This is an interesting way for me to work because, again, I'm used to usually working with solid blacks. Um, and so it, the cleanup process is even a little more mathematical and simple on those things. Um, although I will say you should always, like what we did at the beginning of this in coloring is usually called like separating your your black line art. and And basically your reason for doing that is if you want to do like color holds or anything like that, like color holds are when you uh, color over your line. Or in this case, if I wanted like sections of this um, to appear in color, uh, like instead of just being black, like maybe it's like uh, tones of a different color tone, um, then I could do that. The downside is I, I accidentally went back to my default okay so the downside of uh of working in that in this style where you have like a little more ambiguity on like what's what's your line art and what your like kind of gray tones um that's where it kind of works Uh, Jake said, I work with my BM strips with a grayed out area in the background, and I didn't know until strip 11 I had not properly closed the gaps between the gray area and the panel frame. Yeah, exactly. Okay, there we go. Now it looks nice and clean. Now we're going to get into our, um, our thing. Now, if, like, <laughs> here's the other thing. The coloring process doesn't take as long um, when you're working with like, let's say these were solid black and white with aliased edges. So you have like that step ladder edge. Then when you're doing your flats, it's like relatively quick because you just go in with like your, um, you could literally just use the magic wand, select, then go to a layer color and fill select, expand a little bit so that your colors pulled a little bit underneath the line and then fill. The problem is, in this case, I'm going to have to manually draw my edges because of the fact that, um, yeah, I mean, like my my color is uh, is going to be underneath this. And the neat thing about um, it's going to be underneath all the tones, and I can't make really quick, easy selections of those tones. So I'm going to pull this color again, and let's let's 
do this to, um, I'm going to show you guys just a real quick way to flat this out and we'll get as much of this done as possible um, before 1030 where I'm going to have a hard out so that I, so that I can go check out Gary's stream. So let's see here. Okay. So I'm going to save, save your work always. I'm going to call this layer, uh, I'm going to call this layer lines. And I'm going to, even though it's not just lines, it's more like values. And then I'm going to call this layer uh, color. Okay. And the neat thing is, I, like, this is not like a tutorial that I've practiced or anything like that. Like, we're just going to get in there. So now, basically, what I'm going to use is this, uh, I always forget what the name of this tool is, the uh, polygonal lasso tool. Um, I like using this because everything you do can be basically broken down into a geometric um, shape. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, um, like basically even a circle, if you zoom in long enough, you can reduce down into uh, straight lines. Whereas like organic lines, if you zoom in enough, kind of become straight. It's, it's a very strange thing. Um, so I like to use the, um, the polygonal lasso for like selections that are a little complicated like this, where I'm trying to get that edge, trying to rule it out. And right now what I want to do is I don't want to focus on singular items yet. I just want to do the larger flats um, that are there. And also when I'm making these selections, you'll notice that on the tool, I make sure that anti-aliasing is off because here's the thing. I want aliasing or I want anti-aliasing on my top layer because I want it to look like almost like a charcoal or I think the the better description of like the look I'm going for on this book is like um, there was an old method that you would use using coquille board and a, uh, and a Prismacolor black uh, colored pencil. And if you rendered something on coquille, it would coquille board was like a paper that had like a specific speckle to it. And so it would almost like make your um, your stuff look a little pointillized. Like it, it, this was just a way that a lot of people would do like very quick pencils that you could reproduce and uh, and would have like that sort of organic pencil feel but also be reproducible. I'm kind of trying to get that look with like solid tones underneath without a ton of rendering to those tones because it just fits the uh, Victorian theme a little better um, of the book. And so whenever I'm figuring out like what the tone, and this is just something I would think about, but it's like whenever you're taking on a project, you want to pick like, a medium that makes sense for the story. So like this style may not work really well with all stories. Um, I think that especially with your own personal projects, when you're trying to like figure out like what style should I execute this in? Um, that would be a good thing. So, okay. So now we've, I've made that selection. I've made sure that it's like, I'm trying to kind of roughly get like right smack dab in the middle of the line. Um, and then I'm going to do my fill. And again, this could be any color that you're doing these initial flats in. But uh, but here's the neat thing is like if I go to my line layer, there's no like opacity or layer setting or multiply or anything like that that's going to make the printing process. Like if you have a variety of like 10 different blacks, like that might work on the screen. But it's like when you when you go to print from that, your black line art, is going to have all this patchiness to it because you're, you're telling your printer, like, I want uh, 50 cyan. So it's like doing, like putting in 50 cyan, spitting that out over the black. And then maybe I want 20 yellow or whatever, and it's spitting the yellow over it. But then like another tone of black, if you're not controlling for it, could be like 10% cyan and 50% yellow. And it's like, you're telling your printer to do all these different splotches with the black. And so no wonder, obviously, when you go from 
a, a, a file that looks okay on the screen to a file in print for offset, it's going to have like a lot of inconsistency. This is why it's important to control the tone of the black line that you're doing. Because if you do this, if you do this process, it's going to just print as like one solid, beautiful sheet. And uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully look really good. So, okay, here we go. I'm again, just going to kind of go in and select out all my flat shapes. And we've got another uh, 10 seconds or whatever. Well, not 10 seconds. We, we got a good 40 minutes to kind of hopefully flat out as much of this page as possible before, uh, before Mr. Hodges has his screen. Um, so I'm going through, I'm making these selections and this, this is going to seem kind of meticulous at first, but it becomes really quick. And again, if you had just solid black and white, you would literally just be using the, um, you know, the magic wand tool to create your selections. Um, you'd use, uh, you'd probably set a shortcut to make expand by like one pixel, um, you know, like as a shortcut uh, so that you can expand your selection so that it goes underneath the line a little bit, traps under the line. And then you'd just be doing fill and you'd be doing that throughout the entire process. And then you might use something similar to this to kind of start getting into rendering. But because of the nature of the pages I'm doing here, that's just not an option. Like if I tried to magic wand and fill a lot of these areas, it's just not going to work. So anyhow, a way that I like to color is I like to start with just the overall shapes. Like I know I want my page background to be relatively um, clear. Like I, I like it to be somewhat like, I guess, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but like ambiguous, I guess. Um, even for the edges on, did I say ambiguous? I don't even know what I was meaning there. I, my, my point is for this, I, I like to start, you start with the whole, like I'm picking my larger areas of flat um, and I'm doing them all on this color layer. I'm making sure that the edges are aliased. So that means that if I zoom in really care closely on the color, it's going to look like that. If you had anti-aliasing, you're not going to see like step ladders like that, where it just goes from white to the color instantly. Um, you would see like different a bunch of different pixels and the again like that might look okay on the screen but once you print it you're going to see like little areas of gray between your line and your color or you're going to see um like you're going to have trouble when it comes to later on in the process when you have to make these selections and modify them um so it's just a cleaner thing when you're working with flat color that you want to have flat edges to to make sure you're aliasing your edges now you could do these selections with like the pen tool, which would give you a little more organic line. And especially if you're gonna show a lot of your flat selections, um, I would recommend that, like use your pen tool because you can do more curves and stuff like that. I'm using this because I think it's faster than kind of trying to get in there with a pen tool and then make my line into a selection and all of that. Like, this is a much faster but equally efficient process um, in theory, right? So here we go. We're going to kind of select all of this. I don't know if this is helpful at all. Uh, Jake, are you finding this at all interesting? <laughs> Either way, it's work I have to do for this book. So, um, And again, this isn't like a prepped, uh, you know, demo or anything like that it just happens to be a page i'm working on and i thought hey you know what like it might be cool to walk through this process with everybody so right now what i have is i have my line layers and then i have like some solid areas of 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 color right um for a second layer and then i have a background layer and my line layer i have my transparent pixels locked uh, so far, until I'm done with my my black and white, or sorry, my um, color area, um, I'm not going to lock the transparent pixel pixels. Um, okay. So here we go. And now what I'm going to do 
um, and this is going to be really fascinating, is, I think. Um, I'm going to try and see if this works. This is something, again, like this is, other than the pitch, this is the first page of the book that I've colored. So what I establish here and figure out here through troubleshooting, if I have to, um, is going to be basically the process with which I can color the entire book, right? Um, which again can be a little, a little bad if it's like I establish a wrong method. So we'll see if this works. Um, so here, what I'm going to do? Okay, I just figured something out. So what I want to do here is actually just select the areas that I know I want to have like a flat edge which is going to be a little inside because this is a no border border. Um, Philip said, I'm here listening and I find this really interesting. That's awesome. And again, this is only if you're working in this like kind of rendery style, which is very unique to this comic. So, um, you know, take it or leave it, you know, <laughs> um, especially if you're working, like if you're coloring like this with um Solid black line art, you're wasting valuable time. Like you can do it a lot quicker if you have just solid blacks. Um, and I and I'm excited to kind of even show you guys that process in the future if I'm working on a project that allows for it. So here I'm gonna do that, and then I'm gonna actually without using white, I wanna use uh, I wanna kind of match the tone here of my edge using that again, that Kyle. Webster like a uh, pencil brush. I really want to make sure that I'm kind of matching the, the vibe and the tone of that edge so that um, so that it's going to kind of be possible. And here I'm not worried about an aliased edge. This will make so much sense when I get into kind of selecting and differentiating the different areas of flat color. But for now, um, I think this will work. And I'm kind of thinking out loud as I'm going. So um, I did miss a little corner here. And I don't want like a little straggler down there. OK, delete. I'm going to go to zero and let's see what that looks like. So now we have, um, oh my goodness, I didn't want to delete out. Hold on a second. The nice thing is if you're doing these selections and you need to pull out of it, you can just hit um, option when you're using your uh, your selection tool and, it, and it'll go to negative. So you can cut out, like you can basically, if I hit, um, what is it? Uh, if I hit shift, I can add to my selection. If I hit minus, I can subtract from my selection, which is great. That that means like if you ever get a selection wrong, you can kind of add or or subtract from it. Okay. So now we should be in a scenario where right, that's my dog letting other uh, passing by dogs know not to mess with this stuff. Um, Jake says, you don't know how many times the algorithm loves to push your processing video to my feed from six years ago. Yeah, that may, I mean, that makes sense. Um, and you know, what's funny is like, even the video where I was talking about, uh, cleaning up your inks and coloring has changed a little bit. Like you don't need to use the channel selection as much, um, in that one as, as you did at the time. Uh, because things have changed. All right, so now we have a scenario where I have this nice flat color layer. That's great. And then I ha have uh, my color, and then I have my background uh, all separated. Now, what I've done with my color layer is I've locked the transparent pixels on that. I'm going to save. I'm going to get a refill of coffee, and then we're going to tackle um, uh, basically separating out the, the the lines and stuff like that. One of the great things about this is um, now that I've locked the transparent pixels, uh, I, in theory, I can fill this with any color I want. I'll, I'll even show you guys. So let's say I suddenly am like, I want to do this in magenta. I just want the whole thing in magenta. I can just color fill magenta and boom, it's going to be a very 
hideous magenta, but anyhow, I hope that kind of makes sense. All right, I'll I'll be right back. Um, I'm gonna get a re a recolor, and uh, Jake saying that sepia effect really came together. Yeah, and we're gonna get into it because I want to have solid areas of flat color underneath this, but now we have the basic annoying stuff like that. What I basically have done here is like tried to make an equivalent of if you were gonna do airbrushing or something um, back in the day um, or silk screening um, and, you're, and you're doing flat areas of color, the first thing you wanna do is mask out the areas you don't want color. So that's the, what we've done right now is like the equivalent of taping off the edges of your illustration board so that your art, when it goes over it, is it's just not going to end up on it because it's masked off, right? So that's basically what we've done. I'll be right back with some coffee, okay? Uh, Philip said, can I just say these drawings turned out beautiful? I remember you starting these over a week ago. Thanks. Yeah, this is a finished page, so that's cool. Got a lot of roughs to do for this. Okay, so I'm going to see one thing real quick. Um, what did I do for color on this for my... Okay, so it was white. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're going to do all our white areas on this entire thing. Um, did I have a tone that I was using over the white on this? No, I didn't. Okay, that's good. Okay, that was just the, the a, a rough idea of what the tones are going to look like on the finals. So that's what we need to bring this to. So now I'm at zeros. So all zeros is, is the color white, right? Like zeros on my CMYK slider. And we're going to get into... Uh, now I, I can just deselect everything. I can basically get into making my selections of all the white areas on the page. And I'm going to make this as efficient as possible. And again, some of this might spill over to like, um, you know, Gary's channel eventually, because uh, I know he is streaming at like 11. So I'm going to try to kind of start wrapping up at 1030. So I'm not overlapping with, uh, with Gary's live stream that I think he's going to be doing on Saturdays as well. But we'll see how far we can get on this. So basically what I'm doing is the same exact process, but now I'm picking all my white areas. Um, and you're going to do this for basically every solid area um, on the page. The nice thing is, rather than go through and do that individually, like, okay, so there's people who like to just paint underneath. And if you're doing that, rather than using selection tools, best of luck to you, but you're wasting tons of valuable time. Depending, if you're doing like, you want like even a painterly look, you're still probably wasting a lot of valuable time on flat color because if you're painting the edges of your flats, um, when you get into painting and you need like that mask selection, you're suddenly later on gonna have like this nightmare of a time, um, kind of like rendering out those sections. Whereas if you have like nice alias lines, you can make that selection. You can save that layer with like your different flatted areas and use that in the future to kind of like basically get to whatever flat selection you need without having to redraw it and recreate the wheel. So I'm going to have the sail, I think, be white as well. Um, and I'm using the plus, the shift to, to add a new selection every time. But right now what I'm going to try to do in one foul swoop is basically get everything that I need to of one color selected and worked out. Um, and also I want to say just like anything in art, like if you guys know a quicker way, um, I'm always open to it. I'm always open to hearing 
uh, what is more efficient? Because at the end of the day, I got 230 of these pages to go. So if you got a quicker way, um, I'm all ears, you know? <laughs> um, all right. So I think I want his shirt to be white. Um, his hat is not going to be white, but his shirt will be. So I'm going to get in there and select his shirt. And I want to make sure that my flat selection is going to go all the way to the edge. This will make sense in a second. Once once I have everything selected, you'll see how quick this goes. Um, and the neat thing is, once that happens, I've ruled out that area, and I can move on to the next color. And we just do this for every color on the page. I usually like to start with something like white that you know is going to be in like the eyes of the characters, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like to work... Uh, what's it called? Like reductively, basically, where I'm like, I'm taking something that's complex and then I'm reducing out the complexity of it. Um, okay, so this is going to be white. And if you get like unconfident about, you know, doing it all in one foul swoop, you can kind of fill it in little sections too. If that makes you feel more comfortable. I just like, for me, have done this, kind of process so many times um philip was uh oh uh never mind i thought somebody said something in the chats but i think we're good <laughs> um oh uh jake was saying this will be handy handy to have in like the back pocket just in case of uh print in the future that's cool yeah and i think this might actually be helpful for you jake um because you are working with like multiple tones rather than just like solid black and white um in your line art and and this that would be a, a scenario where like this this would 100 percent apply okay am i having any visible eyeballs here yes i am there's an eyeball that i think is going to be a white color i think this is going to be a white color the other thing i would say when working on art or anything in general <laughs> is just rule out fear, right? Like if you're afraid to try something, especially digitally, um, rule it out. Like as long as you're saving backups and copies of what you're working on in different stages as you're working on it, like like I did with this where I have my line, line art on a totally separate area, layer, on a totally separate file. So if I screw up, I haven't like damaged the art forever. I have everything like iterated on a different kind of part. So in theory, um, I should have nothing to fear. Okay, so I've picked all my areas of white. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And there we go. So now we have our solid area. And again, because we're working in aliasing, um, Here's where this becomes advantageous. So check it out. If I were to use my magic wand, like I want to select something, I can just grab it and it goes flush to the edge, right? That's why you want your colors aliased. So now we've flatted our white areas. Now I'm going to basically go in and I'm going to, again, make sure alias, anti-aliasing is off. And now I'm going to rule out another color. Oh, I, I also am going to turn off continuous. So I select everything of this color. Oh, I thought I would. Continuous is off. There we go. Select all the color. So now I have one more thing I want to do, which is um, I'm going to use my command uh, hue saturation um, tool. And that's command U. And then I'm just going to turn the lightness down a little bit. And I'm going to saturate. Uh, let me see. Actually, I do want to steal. I was going to do that. And then I realized, like, he's he's uh, Elizabeth's brother. So he's probably going to have the same hair color as Elizabeth. Now I'm going to do my hair color. I'm going to save. And I'm going to do um, take away everything that is going to have that hair color. I think in this case, I just want to deal with his hair, <laughs> like this awesome rad mustache. 
and I'm going to model this character after Henry Cavill or whatever, the, the actor who played uh, Superman. Very, like, masculine-looking dude that I think will work for just, like, a g general model of, like, this uh, kind of heroic uh, facial structure. It's pretty good. It'll do. And I'm going to take away his mustache as well. Take it, take that mustache away. Take that out of the equation. No more mustache, mister. In a weird way, I feel like being a colorist or doing like comic book coloring can feel like a video game in like a fun way where you're kind of doing this, this game where eventually after you've attacked enough items, um, you basically start getting your your art done. So so now that I've uh, so I've basically taken out that selection for each of those, and now I'm going to do Shift F5. Aha! So now we've got again. We're going to have now a couple flats, and they're all nicely aliased, so they're very useful later on. Now we're going to select again that color and i'm going to reduce out and get rid of anything that's going to have this skin tone color which i think in this case is just going to be him his head his hands all of that and it is uh 10 13 so a lot of this might continue um again like i'll, I'll go for about 15 more minutes and then we're gonna um head on over to Gary's channel, probably, uh, to watch his live stream as he does forays into this fun, like, art live streaming thing. I think here's a thing that I think is really cool. I think the more of us that are doing these kind of things, the better it is for YouTube because we start generating our own, like, art community. And I feel like the fun of streams, at least streams that I follow, is there's a lot of like cross stream uh, stuff going on. And I don't mean like in a space balls, don't cross the streams kind of way. I mean like in a really fun, like kind of community way where there's a lot of community overlap. I feel like that's a really good place for the art thing to go. Um, Oh, nice. Uh, Jake was saying, whew, someone else uh, thinks the same way about art and it being like a video game. There's so many that compare it to a marathon and you'd, you'd think it's a sport. Yeah, to me, it's more of like, I mean, I guess a sport's an okay analogy too. It's just that like, you know, I, and I've used sports analogies before, but it's like, um, for me, first off, like I'm such a nerd <laughs> that if I use sports analogies, I think it becomes really transparent that I have no idea what I'm talking about because like, I, again, like my familiarity with sports is like pretty slim. Um, although honestly I barely game, but to me, like the video game part is very applicable, especially when it comes to digital art. Um, you are kind of making this like level, um, you know, like you're, you're kind of like trying to defeat the boss um, and the boss in this case is like, you know, this overwhelming hurdle to try to make decent art, you know. Um, okay, so here we go. I'm going to grab this. I, I did miss a little bit. Here's the other thing that's nice is if I want to go in there and draw, I'm going to do it with the pencil tool because that's an alias edge. Um And right now what I'm doing is I'm taking away now, now I'm taking away his skin tone. Right. Um, and maybe I'll take away the skin tones of, of some of the crewmates. But again, I'm just trying to kind of rule out other things I need to worry about. Um, I'm just getting all my flat areas of color taken care of so that I can put them to worry about some other point in time. And I do think actually that skin tone might be something I could take out from this character as well.
I think that I'm going to need another hair tone. That'll be okay. We can kind of work with that. And the great thing about flats is technically you could do these in any color as long as it's separated and different. And then at the end, you can kind of get in there and modify it, which is why a lot of cartoonists will outsource the flatting of their artwork. Because if you have somebody who can make good selections like this, in theory, you know, as long as they're selecting cleanly, um, they don't have to make any color decisions at all at that stage. They just need to basically separate out all your flat areas um, so that you can make quicker, easier modifications and selections. But I, I really do think sometimes we overcomplicate things and sometimes I think keeping it simple is like a really fair and good way to go with this kind of thing. Um, I'm going to grab this guy. Oh, I probably should have had, let's see. Ah, I'll do it later. I, I want to probably do the white color fill for this dude's eyes. Did I just say color fill? That's my work spilling over. When you're working with like uh, manufacturing and you're you're doing color for like items that have color within line that are going to be physically filled with like paint, it's called color filling, right? And so the the downside of <laughs> of what I do all day is that like sometimes uh, some of my verbiage from that job will spill over into this one. Um, okay. So we're going to do zero, 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 zero. And I'm going to go back to my, back to my selection. And I'm using my pencil tool. That's, that's the one time you can use that paint when you're doing flats. And then I'm going to basically reduce out this. And right now I'm just cookie cutting out the parts that I don't want to have that color. Okay. Now let's pick a different color. Uh, actually I can use my hue, hue selection or hue saturation and I can basically make like the lightness dark. Um, I'm going to change the hue. Maybe I want it to be like a, a grayish hue. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll make the lightness the same. And use this as like a, a temporary color hold. What do I want to do next? I think I want to do that hat. So actually, let's let's go back. Um, I'm going to make the hat. And you know what? I'm going to turn off the line so I get a better picture of my color. I think I'm going to have the hat be a color like, like so. And when I, when I do this, uh, especially when you're getting into yellows, you want to make sure there's no um, blue in that yellow selection. And I think I like the idea of this being a little more saturated. So let's up the saturation a bit. And then I'm going to turn the lightness down a little bit. I think that works pretty well. So now we've got our hat color. And I'm going to save. And we've got a good 10 minutes to go. Do I like that hat color? I think I do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jake said, I'm going to steal your skin tone would be a good punk title song. Most people can't climb out, A, because it's so slippery. But this guy's egg dupe, so he can't All right, so get rid of that selection. Now we're deselecting this hat. Deselect the hat would be a good, uh, actually, a, a lot of art terminology would make for like pretty cool, like indie bands. And I'm, I'm going to kind of, there's a couple of colors where I might have to kind of add them in in a bit, right? Like, I kind of like this for maybe the ropes as well, but we'll kind of get into that. Right now, I'm going to kind of concern myself mostly with 
my characters and uh, we'll see how, how far this, how much mileage I can get from just my characters being flatted out. And then we're going to basically throw this in. Remember, it's all the moms. We've got one character, but she covers every role. There we go. Or it could be because she's still young and hasn't. Oh, she could just be non minor. I mean, that's what I saw on um, news. They were like, why are they being like non minor? All right, and we got this going. <laughs> Jake said, uh, deselect myself from society, showing uh, off my hues to eternity. I can see that. All right, let's see here. So now we've got that hat color picked. I think I'm going to go with, okay, what do I want his suit color to be now? Um, so I'm going to save, and then we've got a good seven minutes left of the stream. But, um, you know, as as I've said, I, I kind of intend to hopefully uh, continue this a little bit later. All right. And I, I do kind of like that dark blue. I don't want it to be too saturated. But I like that dark blue a little bit for the hat. I'm wondering if I want it a little more. Yeah, I kind of dig that for the hat and suit. He's going to have like a matching hat band and suit. So now we're going to deselect that. I'm going to go through and deselect the suit, the tie. The one thing I want to keep, though, here is I feel like he's got a pretty cool little, like, suit jacket. And I want that undercoat or whatever, um, the vest. I was looking for that word, and I'm in the art process, so some words start conflating with other words. Um so I'm going to I'm going to do the tie, the jacket and the like the vest is going to remain un unseparated because I I'm going to change that color. So now we're going to do Man, Jake in the chats is uh writing a punk song. Um Photoshop punk song. Photoshop comic book coloring punk song. The the song would be called what? CMYK for life. <laughs> Actually, that would make for like a really rad tattoo. You know the classic kind of like hipster or sailor tattoo where you have the X and then you have like the different like letters standing for something around the X. It would be amazing to do that, but then have it say C-M-Y-K. I kind of want to get that tattoo now. Actually, that would be pretty amazing. Now I'm, it's funny. I think my, uh, I think my sister-in-law might be getting a tattoo soon, so maybe I'll I'll try to sneak that in and get one too. <laughs> so I've been due for another tat for a while, and it would be fun to do. Man, a CMYK one. I don't know. That might be a little overboard. What if the printing process changes, right? But that would say a lot as a tattoo, right? Because it's like I do have a vast love for uh, print. All right, let's see here. Hey, 
We're getting there, guys. And then... Uh, Give it some. And then they just fall down the waterfall. All right. Cool, we're getting there. Now I want to figure out what I'm going to do for the... I'm gonna figure out what I'm gonna do for the um the the jacket. Hmm. Let's see it with the lines. Ooh, I like the gray. I like the idea of a gray for the jacket. Okay, we're gonna do that gray. For the jacket color right. or not the jacket my goodness the vest Can you hear me? Sorry. What? Mm. Mm. i want your vest to be gray sir that'll do it i missed a chunk here and this is where again like as long as i'm using the pencil we should be okay for kind of correcting that Okay, let's let's talk about pants now, guys. We have two minutes left of the stream. <laughs> Screen CMYK bruises, magic wand, the nuisance. Oh my goodness, Jake! I love your punk song. You need to record this. I I think that would be amazing. All right, let's see here. A little bit of a purpley gray, but I kind of like that. I'm going to do pants now, and I want the pants to be, let's see, is that too much to have the pants be like a, I mean, that's clashy, but the weird thing about the Victorian era is they did clash a little bit. Hold on, I want to start with his hat color, because I feel like he's wearing kind of light pants. So let's go back to that. Hmm. What pants shall you wear, sir? Should it be like a light, light blue? Is that a good pant color or too much? I'm liking that. All right, once these pants tones, oh, wait a minute. Let's see. I want to do a little more desaturation on those pants. I want them like gray and maybe a little bit darker, just a little bit. All right. I hope you guys can see how if you had like solid black lines, why that would speed up the coloring process, because you could literally you wouldn't have to draw these selections as long as you inked really cleanly and you clean it up really cleanly. The only catch is if you do this like two story style, um, which is the graphic novel I did that has a lot of hatching, then you end up in the same scenario where you, you will have to draw a lot of these selections. All right, so I'm gonna wrap these pants and then I'll show you guys, since we are gonna wrap the stream pretty soon, um, how you could take a break without losing all your selections. Um, because now I have all that deselected area and I wanna not have to redraw the one that I'm working on now, the color that I'm working on now. Um, and so I wanna show you guys how you could quickly do that. What I like to do is pick a color um, that's like really arbitrary. Like um, I, I'm going to pick just a hundred percent magenta because I'm not. I'm probably not going to use a hundred percent magenta. 
but I'm going to use that to kind of signify, okay, that's the selected areas I haven't finished. So right now I have my selections for all my dudes a little bit um, and for the hat and all that stuff and the rest of these selections I need to work on. So, um, but at least we kind of know roughly what's going on. Okay, this is going to look so good. All right, so we're going to save and then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call it. So um, now uh, you'll notice that I didn't do these plugs at the beginning because I'm going to start doing them at the end of the streams. If you liked what I was working on or you found it useful or anything like that, obviously make sure you're subscribed. You've hit that bell. Uh, you've hit uh, like and, and you know commented and all that fun stuff. But definitely make sure you've hit that bell so you get notifications when I'm about to stream live. I'm probably going to do it again. Um, uh, also, uh, I have a graphic novel, Jacob's Apartment, which is um, a, a story that's in, it's a slice of life, uh, doomed romance uh, comic coming out from Graphic Mundi, and it's available at bookstores everywhere. Um, if you're a fan of like Eternal Sunshine or of The Spotless Mind or um, or uh, Ghost World or books in that vein, this book should be right up your alley. Um, and uh, that should be something you would pre-order. So go to your local bookstore and say, hey, carry Jacob's apartment or pre-order it online today. And then uh, if you want to read my work currently, um, uh, you know, right now you can buy two stories, which is my graphic novel that talks about my journey dealing with depression and uh, caregiving for somebody with panic disorder and stuff like that. So um, uh, Philip said, uh, I'd like to come back when you continue. I've got notifications on. That's awesome. Um, and for now, basically, I'd encourage also you guys to check out Gary Hodge's uh, channel on YouTube because I will be probably watching that at like 11 as he's doing his stream. And then I'll be back to streaming on my channel after that. Um, but two stories you can order on uh, on Amazon for a really reduced rate. And if you have Prime, it's like free shipping and it should ship to you relatively quickly. So I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go so I can take a shower real quick and then hopefully uh, hop um, on watching uh, Gary's stream. Have a good one. Thanks to everybody who showed up uh, on in the chats. Philip, Jake, uh, everybody who's watching or watching after the fact. I really appreciate you guys. And it's been fun to see the channel grow and actually to start getting actual uh, like checks from YouTube, like not huge ones, but like it's kind of neat. Um, that I'm well on my way to like that second YouTube chat, which is kind of an amazing uh, check, which is kind of amazing because it took forever for like uh, me to even monetize this channel. So I really appreciate um, everybody. I appreciate what you guys are. It, it helps me continue uh, creating and making stuff. All right. Have a good night, guys. And I'll see you on the uh, on the next stream or maybe over at Gary's channel. Have a, Have a good one. And I just said night. So I definitely need to shower, have more coffee and wake up. Um, all right. Have fun on your art journeys. Talk to you guys later. Bye.